This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Teamistry, a podcast that tells the stories of teams who work together in new and unexpected ways to achieve remarkable things. Each episode tells a unique story and provides practical lessons for your team and your business. I actually got a sneak peek of season two and was immediately sucked in with the fascinating stories, beautiful editing, and practical tips that I was able to apply to my business. Search for Tea Mystery anywhere you listen to podcasts. We will include a link in the show notes and my thanks to Tea Mystery for their support. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Future of Work with your host, yours truly, Jacob Morgan. Today I have another special episode for you. You know, it's interesting, I've done probably, I don't know, five, 600 of these podcasts over the years. And still, one of the most popular episodes that that keep coming up are the ones that I've done with my wife, Blake. And I think we maybe have done two or three over the years. And whenever we do one together, people always say, you should do more together. You you should do more of these interviews. They're a lot of fun. Which, by the way, if you want to hear more of us, you can check out byobpodcast.com, which is all about entrepreneurship. But I digress. What I wanted to share with you today is an interview that... Blake actually did with me. So she is interviewing me, and this is something that we actually originally aired on her podcast show called The Modern Customer. And I had such a great time doing it, and I thought it was, uh, there was a lot of valuable content and information, and Blake received a lot of really great feedback on it. So I also wanted to share that episode here as well for all of you. And again, this is Blake interviewing me And the topic, the title of the episode was How to Master Customer Experience Leadership. However, this is just for leadership across the board. So anybody who is either a leader currently or wants to be a leader over the coming years, I think you're going to get a lot of value and a lot of insights from this conversation. And of course, please make sure to check out my wife's podcast, Blake Morgan. Her podcast is called The Modern Podcast customer podcast. Uh, We've done a couple episodes on there. And if you're interested in anything related to customer experience, customer service, customer strategy, that is what she talks about on her show. And what I want to share with you now is the interview that we did together. I hope you enjoy it. The world is changing quickly. What do you need to know and do in order to be successful now and in the future? From leadership to the future of work to employee experience, this show will give you the insights and the tools you need to succeed and thrive professionally and personally. Make sure to follow me on Spotify or subscribe to the show on your favorite platform. You can do so easily by going to futureofworkpodcast.com. Also, please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show and I personally appreciate it. Jacob, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Thank you for having me. So today I have my husband, Jacob, on the show. Jacob, you're here because I know that my audience is struggling with some very specific leadership issues right now. We are still in COVID. There is no light at the end of the tunnel yet, and companies are really struggling to figure out how to set up their leaders to be more successful in these very difficult times where employees are struggling, Uh, now everyone is remote, Uh, people are at work wearing masks, and times are complicated. So, Jacob, I'm really excited to have you on my show today to share your expertise in leadership with my listeners. What is the one thing that you think people have really gotten wrong about leadership that um, you've written about in your book? And tell us about your book, The Future Leader. Sure. So I'll first start with some information about the book while I uh, delay as I think of an answer to your the first part of the question. So my book is called The Future Leader, as you mentioned, and it's based on interviews I did with 140 of the world's top CEOs from organizations like Unilever, Oracle, Oracle, uh, MasterCard, uh, Best Buy, Verizon, Audi, and many, many others. And I also partnered with LinkedIn and we surveyed around 14,000 employees around the world. And the goal of the book was to look at how is leadership changing? What is it going to look like? And what do we need to do now to be future ready leaders? 
So the main part of the book is looking at a set of skills and mindsets that leaders need to possess in order to be successful. And the funny thing is that this was originally meant to be a book focused on the future, but with what we're seeing as a result of COVID and Black Lives Matter and all that other stuff, a lot of the things that I talk about in the book are actually more important to practice now, not just thinking about them in terms of the future. So what's like one example of Uh, something that you're hearing about with COVID, with cultural issues like uh, Black Lives Matter? Um, Like what is one thing that you realize from you, you took away from all the research that you did, all the interviews that you feel like people really need to retain that message now? Oh my goodness. I wish there was just one thing. Um, so probably a few things. The first, probably the most shocking thing that I learned from writing this book is that most people actually become leaders at some point in their 20s, but they don't actually get any formal leadership training until they're in their um, mid to late 30s, or early 40s. Wow. So there's a period of time in your life around 15, 20 years where you're responsible for leading others, but you weren't actually taught how to do it. I can't imagine me having been a manager, a leader when I was in my 20s. No. Pretty I mean, sure I had nothing to teach anyone. But even mid-20s or late 20s, you know, you're maybe you get put on a team and you're responsible for one other person or two other people. So you're a leader in some capacity, but nobody teaches you how to do it. And so the one important thing here is that everybody deserves to get leadership development training, not just the people who've been at the company for 20 years who make the most amount of money. Uh, So that I thought was very, very shocking. The other thing that I thought was especially shocking was that um, when we surveyed these 14,000 employees with LinkedIn, we asked... Wait, what? What'd you do? Surveyed 14,000 employees. (laughs) I just wanted my audience to hear that again. So Jacob did. So he did 140 interviews with CEOs for this book and... and 14,000 employees. Surveyed 14,000 people on LinkedIn. So no, sir, with LinkedIn. They with were the LinkedIn. they were the survey partner. But I mean they they did the survey on their platform too. So okay. I guess technically it is with LinkedIn and on LinkedIn. And the crazy thing there was that we asked a series of questions and we split up the questions based on um, individual contributor, mid level manager, and senior level leader. And so we asked all the leaders in the company, how well do you think you're practicing these skills and mindsets that I talk about in the book? Um, things like emotional intelligence thinking like a futurist, coaching and mentoring others, uh, having a growth mindset, curiosity. Uh, I mean, we can talk about these things later. But I asked all these leaders, how well are you doing with these things? And by and large, leaders said that, you know, we're doing pretty good. Um, Not amazing, but we're doing pretty good. And some even thought they were in the amazing category. And then I asked the people who work for these leaders, and I said, how well do you think your leaders are doing with these skills and mindsets? And the people who work for the leaders actually said, oh my God, our leaders are doing terrible. So this is a little bit scary because what is it shows- Is it like how people think they're better drivers than they actually are? Yes, people think they're better listeners than they are. People think they're better drivers than they are. And the same thing is true when it comes to leadership is that a lot of people, a lot of leaders think they're doing a very good job, but the people who work for them say they're not. So Most people hate their boss, just in my experience. It seems like most of my friends- well, even from the research that I found in the book, a lot of people don't like their leaders. A lot of people don't trust their leaders. A lot of people think they could do a better job than their leaders. Why is that? Um, well, I think by and large, leadership around the world is failing. And I have a whole section in the book called The Leadership Gap, which um, goes over that in more detail. But simply put, we don't train leaders the right way. Um, we've used outdated practices when it comes to leadership and just kind of assume that they're, um, they're going to work. I mean, a lot of leadership principles are based on concepts from 100, 200 years ago that are outdated. We don't incentivize leaders the right way. We don't um, offer leadership training that's modern and relevant and current. So there are lots of problems when it comes to um, leadership inside of organizations today. Um, And we also don't teach everybody to be a leader. I mean, there is a period of like 15, 20 years, like I said, where people just have to kind of figure this stuff out on their own. So you're saying that not till people are like 40 years old are they getting leadership training on average yeah okay something you said is metrics is we don't measure leaders correctly and that's something you've probably heard me talk about with customer experience that probably that there's really no incentive for leaders to be customer focused um, because they just need to meet their quarterly goals um, what what are the things you're seeing that companies are measuring and what do you think is a better measurement? Well, it's not so much that we're not measuring 
leaders. I mean, a lot of how we measure leaders are based on dollars and cents. And I think we need to do a better job of measuring things like human factors. So employee health and well-being, employee experience, um, diversity and inclusion, sustainability efforts. Uh, I mean, human factors inside of organizations that will tell you if you're working for good leaders or not. I mean, the- But when you say leader, is that like a big top executive or is that a manager? No, like okay, a so that's, manager. that's a good question. So in the context of the of, of the book, um, well, first, I think anybody can be a leader. You can be a leader of a team, a leader of a company, a leader of a department. You can also be a leader of self, right? Just, I mean, life is hard as it is, and you need to lead yourself sometimes. So the, the skills and mindsets that I talk about in the book are applicable for anybody, whether you're leading a big company, a team, or just leading yourself. Okay, so basically everyone listening could get something from this book. Yeah, of course. And definitely. from your course that you're launching. That yes, you launched. yes. We didn't talk about the, the course, but um, uh, it's coming out. Well, I guess by the time the podcast comes out, we're going to have the course open for this week until August 14th. And if anybody's interested in learning more about it, you can go to futureleadercourse.com and see what's inside, what's included. I mean, there's a lot of fun stuff in there. So people can check that out. Why do you think people who are already really busy just trying to keep their head above water need to do things like read your book and take your course and really work on themselves maybe they're not even incentivized to do it so why should they do that well there's two reasons one i suppose this is a selfish reason if you want to succeed and thrive in this rapidly changing world that we're all a part of you need to work on yourself it's one of the mindsets that i talk about in the book uh, the mindset of the explorer um, where you need time to be curious, you need time to work on yourself. Um, these are crucial aspects of leadership because nobody's going to look out for you but you. So if somebody's not going to teach you leadership skills and leadership mindsets, but you want to become a leader and you want to grow and succeed in your career, guess what? You got to do this stuff yourself. Um, so I think it is crucial. It doesn't matter where you are in life or where you are in your career. But if you have bigger aspirations, you want to grow, you want to make an impact on the world, you want to uh, influence change, then you have no choice but to work on yourself. But if you're content with mediocrity, if you're content with being where you are forever, then hey, by all means, don't do anything and just uh, keep your head above water, which is what I think most people in the world do. Yeah, I think people are stressed right now. Um, we just actually had a baby. <laughs> I know in our... Even in our own house, things have gotten a little hard because we don't have the same systems that we used to have that we could rely on. So what advice do you have for, and my audience are customer experience leaders, so they're dealing with um, small fires all the time with customers' problems. Um, what, what advice do you have for something, a tip from your book that people can immediately start doing? And, and think about my audience of customer experience professionals. Like, What is one piece of advice you have for them that you've learned from your research? Well, I think probably the best place to start is to define leader and leadership for yourself. Um, th this doesn't matter if you're in customer experience, customer service, employee experience. Regardless of the role that you're in, you have to define what leadership means. What does it mean to be a leader? This was actually the hardest questions for the hardest question for the 140 CEOs to answer. Mm -hmm. And it's because we don't think about it. We all assume that we know who a good leader is and what leadership is because we see it all the time. When you go to the grocery store, when you turn on the TV, you listen to the news, you experience leadership in some way all the time. They call the cover of a magazine at a grocery store. Is that what you mean? No, like when you go to the checkout, you see who the supervisor is. And oh, right. Like okay. you see leadership everywhere many, many times a day. And By the way, that is depressing at our local grocery store when I see the manager yeah. and I so see, you can what see schmuck they are. So most people <laughs> know um, what good leadership and bad leadership, they think they know what good and bad leadership is like. So we don't spend enough time defining it because we see it so often. It's sort of like trying to explain or define water to somebody. You know, nobody explains or defines water because we all assume that we know what water is and you don't have to explain to somebody this is this is water. Leadership is the same. Uh, it's all around us, and so we never take a step back to explain it and to define it. This is why you can go in a company, and in the same company, you'll have a leader who everybody loves and admires and respects, and in the same company, you have a leader that everybody hates and wants to get away from. It's because the way that those people got promoted, the people who promoted them have different definitions of leadership. So the first thing that I think everybody needs to do is to define what does it mean to be a leader? 
what is leadership? And the reason why you want to start with that is because that is going to create the filters that will dictate what the next leader looks like. And if you don't have those filters in place, then all sorts of people are getting promoted. Everybody has different filters. Some people have no filters. And all of a sudden you get a company that has a mix of good leaders and bad leaders. If you want great leaders, you have to start with defining leader and leadership and what those filters are. And our Yorkie, Athena, mm -hmm. agrees with me. Yeah, I think in the contact center world and customer experience, good leaders are people that came up through the ranks that maybe started in service um, or or sales, um, but they're not they don't necessarily have good people skills. I'd like to actually flip this and ask you, what is a good leader in your opinion? For me, a good leader is somebody who masters and well, I'll, I'll give you kind of the visual that I use. And the cover of my book is a lighthouse, which. Blake helped me <laughs> come up with the cover idea. Uh, I Why are you embarrassed? Of course I helped you. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not amazing. embarrassed. I, so I struggled <laughs> with a cover idea for the book and we had all sorts of ideas of like a telescope and then... I love... That's because I love stories and I love... What's the word for like images that represent... Visualizations? I don't know. Allegor... Uh, no. People but, are going to realize... But the, but the point is... <laughs> so the cover of the book is a lighthouse which Blake helped me come up with. It's a metaphor, I guess. And yeah, it's, uh, I think sometimes we have to turn to history to get a good idea of the present and the future. And a lighthouse is designed to help mariners and explorers reach their destinations, um, but also to do so in a safe way, keep them off shallow waters, keep them off the rocks that might strand their ships. And I think of leaders very much the same way. The whole purpose of a leader is to guide their people and their organizations to success, but in a safe way. So as a leader, you have to learn a set of skills and mindsets that allow you to build yourself up to become this lighthouse so that you have this big, bright light that you can shine onto the, the sea of uncertainty that we're all a part of and shine it onto, onto others. But the thing is that if there are no ships in the water, then a lighthouse is useless. And that's what a lot of leaders forget is that if you become a great leader just yourself, um, if you don't have any ships in the water, then you're kind of useless as a leader. So the, the key thing here is don't just focus on yourself, but you also have to focus on others. Guide other ships to safety, guide other ships to success, uh, not just yourself. So that to me, I think is a good, good visual of a leader. As far as what makes a great leader, I think it's practicing the mindsets and skills that I talk about in the book, which I refer to as the notable nine. It's uh, four mindsets and five skills that these CEOs identified as being most crucial. Well, now, of course, we want to know what are they? Yes, now we need to go through the mindsets and skills. So I gave all of them funny, quirky names, which, of course, Blake also helped me come up with some of these names. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly name them and give an overview of each one. The first is the mindset of the explorer. In mindsets, again, are how you think, and then skills are things that you actually need to know how to do. So the mindset of the explorer is about curiosity, uh, being a perpetual learner, adaptability and agility, uh, having a growth mindset. These are all very, very crucial ways for you as a leader to think. The mindset of the chef is about balancing humanity and technology because these are the two big ingredients, the two big forces inside of your company and you need both, but you also need to make sure you don't have too much of one or too, uh, too much of the other. So the chef mindset is about balancing being purpose-driven and caring and also balancing this idea of technology. I call it humanity, but the IT is, it's H-U-M-A-N-I-T. So hopefully people can get mm, kind of the that's very clever. human IT. The next mindset is the mindset of the servant, which is about serving your leaders, your team, your customers, and yourself, and also having humility and vulnerability. Most people don't think of uh, serving themselves I think you've even, even talked about this as well, where you put your own oxygen mask on first before you help others. Uh, so you have to serve four groups. The next mindset is the mindset of the global citizen, which is about thinking big picture, thinking globally, surrounding yourself by people who are not like you. Next are the five skills, uh, starting off with the skill of the futurist, which is about thinking in terms of scenarios and possibilities. The skill of Yoda is about emotional intelligence, which is empathy and self-awareness. 
skill of the translator about listening and communication, which are timeless, but have been around, I mean, but have changed now more than ever. And the last two are the skill of the coach, which is about motivating and engaging, empowering others, uh, creating effective teams, working across generations and cultures, creating future leaders. And the last skill is the skill of the technology teenager, which is basically being tech savvy and digitally fluent. So again, these are the things that a lot of leaders think they're doing a decent job at, but the people who work for these leaders say they are doing a terrible job at. So there's a lot of room for us to improve in these things. If you're enjoying this episode, please remember to check out our sponsor, Teamistry. Season two of their podcast is out now and is hosted by award-winning documentary filmmaker, Gabriella Copperthwaite, the director of Blackfish. It's a fascinating show filled with great insights and stories. Check it out by searching for Teamistry anywhere you listen to podcasts. We will also include a link in the show notes. And thanks again to Teamistry for their support. When you were doing 140 interviews, Jacob, was there one common thread that over and over you heard CEOs say again and again? Well, many threads, but I guess it depends around what... And this is pre-COVID that you did these interviews. Yeah, I mean, the big... The overall big theme was that leadership is changing. And because one of the questions that I asked them is, is leadership changing? And if so, how? And I specifically said, if you were to take a lot of the things that you know, um, things that you did 10 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, and if you just repeated the same stuff today and in the future, would you be just as good of a leader? And almost all the CEOs said no, because things are changing. And if you think about it, a lot of people have become leaders, not because they are genuinely good leaders, but because they are good at navigating office politics and bureaucracy. They stayed at the company for a long time. They have friends in the company. I think some people are just really confident as well. Maybe they, put they up made a, a lot face. of money. They they yeah they put up a, a you know fake facade. Now not all leaders obviously, but a lot of leaders that's how they get promoted, and you know. Back when I had full-time jobs working for other people, I remember when I interned for Morgan Stanley, this guy who hired me and allowed me to intern there was a VP. And then like two weeks into my job, he's packing his stuff. And it was because he, he was a leader. He stopped bringing in a ton of money and he immediately got fired. They let him go. And this is how it is in a lot of organizations. So the CEOs who I interviewed said, that's not going to work anymore. Leadership now and in the future is something that you need to earn. It's about putting people first. It's about uh, practicing these skills and mindsets. And it's about understanding that the world is different. So the, the VP of the VP got fired because he didn't make money that quarter. But you're saying maybe in the modern world, because this was a while ago. Yeah, like 15 years ago. No, more. They would have, the leader would have fixed his tools maybe or worked on his employee experience to retain him? Or? No, well, the point is he wouldn't have gotten promoted to begin with just because okay. he made a lot of money. Understood. Um, so you can't promote people and you can't get in a position of power and expect to be a great leader just because you make a ton of money. And the leaders that I interviewed specifically said that with globalization, technology, uh, the changing nature of talent, a big shift towards purpose and meaning and transparency that we are living in a new world and that we are working in a new type of company. And because of that, we need a new type of leader. And this is why we need to think differently about leadership because the world is different and our businesses are gonna be different. So you need a new type of leader. I mean, we haven't talked that much about COVID, but the world has changed so much. Yeah. And I mean, you're out there doing your podcast show, interviewing tons of people. Um, I mean, it seems like the biggest theme to me is just the virtual and remote work. Mm -hmm. um, and you've written a book on employee experience. And I know you you felt like the content in your book and your course was really relevant to navigating the difficulties of managing in a, in a remote world. Do you have an idea of how we can think differently about remote management and, and start to do a better job than we've been doing? Yeah, there are a few things. And leadership has always been hard but now when you can't even see people it's even harder so i think there are a couple things that leaders need to remember for leading in a remote world and i'll give a couple maybe practical tips first is 
especially in a remote world, you need to start off all your conversations by focusing on your people. You don't, don't jump on a phone call and say, how are the sales going? How are the projections? How's the project going? Give me an update on this. Give me an update on that. You jump on your phone calls and you say, how are you doing? Are you safe? Is your family safe? Are you okay? You need to make sure that you put people first. People need to see you as a human leader. I think another thing that's crucial for leaders is to be vulnerable first. You can't expect people to be open with you if you are not going to be open with them. And now, especially during COVID, you need to be open with them. So when you jump on a phone call with your team, you can tell them, oh man, things are going crazy at home. Like, I mean, you and I both have teams and you've heard me talk on the phone with my team and I've heard you talk on the phone with your team. And we're pretty open and transparent with them of like, oh, you know, it's it's kind of hectic. You know, we have the baby here. We're a little stressed out. There's a lot going on. Like we talk to them like human beings. We're We're vulnerable with them first so that they can see that we too are struggling and going through our own challenges with COVID. And that way, when you ask them, how are you doing? They're going to be just as open with us. Is there a limit, though, to how much you want to let your team see how vulnerable you I think there might be. Mm, I mean, being... You want to cry in front of them or... I mean, I know plenty of leaders who've cried in front of their people. Why not? Um, I mean, if you're comfortable enough with your people, sure, do what you want. You know, I it's... Uh, how vulnerable you want to be is a very subjective thing. It's kind of up to you as a individual. Um, but I know lots of leaders who have been very, very vulnerable. Some who have been somewhat vulnerable. It's, it depends on your comfort level. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's like a, I'm being too vulnerable with my team. I mean, if you start sharing all of your personal stories and you assume that everybody at the company is your best friend, probably not a good idea. And if that's what you're doing, then you probably need to work on like, you know, just, social cues and social awareness and <laughs> yeah don't don't talk about your marriage problems uh, yeah too, you know maybe? stuff like that is maybe a little too extreme so i think being vulnerable is crucial putting your people first is crucial and this might sound weird but um it's technology related if you want to be an effective leader of a virtual team for goodness sakes people get yourself a decent quality microphone and a camera and it sounds like a weird thing like what does that have to do with leadership but guess what if people can't hear you well, and if people can't see you well, you're going to have a hard time leading them. I can't tell you how many phone calls I've been on or how many presentations I've been on or how many I've seen where you get these senior level executives who are sitting in a room and there's a big bright light behind them so you can't even see their face. You know, they're just like a silhouette. They're using a regular laptop, uh, laptop mic that keeps cutting in and out so you can't hear all the words that they're saying. Meanwhile, they're trying to give you these really motivational and powerful messages, and it doesn't work. People need to see you clearly, and they need to hear you clearly. So if you want to be an effective leader of a virtual team, especially now, get yourself a decent quality mic and a decent quality um, uh, camera. Because in person, people can see you and they can hear you very clearly. And communication is a big part of leadership. Virtually, if they can't see you and they can't hear you well, you know, a lot of your effectiveness as a leader goes out the window. You're not going to motivate and engage and empower people through a wonderful email that you send. Uh, it can certainly be a tool, but people need to see you and they need to hear you to be motivated by you to be able to, you know, build that relationship and connection. So I think those are important places to start. And it's really interesting that a lot of the conversations lately have shifted away from AI and technology to really being human so now more than ever leaders need to put their people first practice emotional intelligence practice empathy uh, put people first i think is probably the best piece of advice i have for any leader at any company in any role because i know you i'm going to ask you this question because i know you know the answer to this um we have a local waffle shop that i would say is a great illustration of empathetic leadership. Do you want to tell the story of the waffle shop? Yes. I love my waffle story. Uh, so it's called Oli's Waffle Shop in Alameda, California. It's probably it's where we live. <laughs> yeah. It's probably four or five miles away from where we live. And the owners of this waffle shop were getting ready to retire, I think next year. And they bought themselves a wonderful piece of land and they were going to build themselves a dream house there. And COVID hit and their waffle shop lost a ton of money. And well, first I should preface, if you go into this waffle shop, you will see pictures of employees framed hanging on the walls. So 
they clearly care about and value their people. They have a philosophy of putting people first. And so what happened is when COVID came about, a lot of their employees really started to struggle. They didn't have enough money to pay for their basic expenses. So this husband and wife entrepreneurial team that is responsible for 40 employees, they sold their plot of land. And instead, they decided to put $400,000 of their money back into the business. Uh, for their employees to be able to pay them a living wage so that they can afford to exist, pay for groceries, pay for their rent. And that to me, I love that story because we hear about these billion dollar companies who had to lay off 5,000 employees. Meanwhile, we have um, mom and pop entrepreneurial team responsible for 40 employees willing to give up their dream home so that other employees um, can can thrive. So for me, putting people first is... It's about a philosophy backed by a set of actions, not just believing that people come first, but showing it. And I think that's where a lot of leaders struggle. Don't just believe it, but you actually need to be able to show it. It seems to me in this country, at least, that we're having a bit of a leadership crisis right now. Like people don't know who to look to for leadership. And I think that's a great opportunity for business to put a stake in the ground on what you're saying, empathy, uh, self-awareness, um, consideration for other people. If there's one lasting message you'd like to leave my audience with from your book, what what would you say that one message is? Um, oh my goodness, that's a tough or question. Or your course. Yeah, well, so I'll mention the course for sure, but I want people to consider that in over the next 10 years, I think we're going to have around 250 or so million leaders around the world. These are people who are responsible for the lives of others, these are people who shape society, they shape the world, they shape culture, they shape our values. And if we're going to have 250 million people in leadership positions, we better make sure that we have the right people in place. If we want to be a part of a world that we're all proud to live in, and if we want to be a part of organizations that, you know, where we genuinely want to show up to work. So this is a very, very important thing for us to focus on, not just for companies, but for the world at large. And the big, uh, sort of the big piece, the big nugget from all of this is just encourage people, I encourage people to think like a lighthouse. Build yourself up by all means, but remember that if there are no ships in the water, then being a leader is, is useless. There's a long way to go, and being a leader is the hardest job there is, but it's also the most rewarding. And I can actually share a story. What are you doing? I'm like holding a book here in my way. I, I, are you playing with the book or are you looking for something? No, I'm looking for something. Okay. I'm looking for the story. Okay, I'll uh, allow you to look for your story. Thank you. There's a <laughs> story. Uh, one of my favorite stories from the book is from Cheryl Palmer. Um, I think I remember most of it. And she, Oh, here it is. So Cheryl Palmer is the CEO of Taylor Morrison, and she told me this really compelling story. I asked her, what was the single most impactful moment that shaped your your leadership trajectory, like who you are as a leader. And she told me this story about how she had to write two letters to her team. One letter was, I'll see you in six weeks. And the other letter, the other letter was, uh, carry on our journey, you know, keep the legacy going. And so Cheryl had a brain tumor and she was going in for surgery. And the two letters that she wrote are, one was the letter that she wanted her team to receive if, if her surgery didn't go well, which I think we all know what that means. And the second letter is the one that she wanted her team to receive is if the surgery went well and then she would be back at the company in six weeks. And she told me that that was a very impactful moment because having to write those letters and think about everything really changed her life and who she is as a leader. And I'll read you this quote from, from the book. And she said, although I always believed I lived life to the fullest and looked for the good in each person and situation, going through this, and this meaning this, this surgery, this experience, made me realize how precious each life encounter really is. It made me a better leader because I was able to appreciate how important every interaction is and not to take anything or anyone for granted. Many leaders go through their days fighting fires and not appreciating the golden rule of business, that people work for people and not companies. A leader's responsibility is to set the vision and not allow the business to just happen, but rather make relationships and interactions intentional, meaningful, and purposeful. Some may consider it really hard work, but being a leader is a choice, and if you decide that this is who you really are, there is no middle ground, it's all-consuming, no two parallel paths. Being a leader can't just be when you show up to the office, 
It's your natural passion in an eerie intersection in all parts of our lives. But when you really do it, it's the most rewarding life journey in the world. And that's one of my favorite quotes from the book from Cheryl Palmer. And I think that's, uh, um, I don't know. I, I got goosebumps when she told me that story. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful story. And it reminds me of just being a parent, too. Yeah. Like you and I are parents, and you got to yeah. be strong. And One of the kids is sitting right next to us sleeping, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, I had to adjust his pacifier. Um, well, Jacob, you are so good at what you do. I'm so proud of you. And Thank I know you. my audience would really benefit from checking out your course. Where can they find more info about your course that's based on the Future Leader book? Yes, so I, I'm very, very excited and proud of this course because... I, we basically put together something that I wish that organizations had. Uh, and it's based on all these interviews and these CEO surveys and the 14,000 employees we looked at. And the URL for that is futureleadercourse.com. And when people sign up, well, first you go to the page and you'll see all the information about the course. The enrollment, I believe, is open till August 14th. And you'll see that there is surveys and assessments you get access to me via the course platform there's interactive videos you get a couple of coaching calls that are included uh, there's a ton of really really useful content in there you'll get transcripts you can get mp3s if you prefer to listen to it instead of not uh, watch it um, so i'm very very proud of it and i hope people decide to check it out and i can give should i give my contact info if people, sure so if anybody has any questions about it as long my, as it's not your phone number no 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 <laughs> So future leader course is for the course. And my email is jacob at the future organization.com. Well, Jacob, this has been enlightening and I love listening to you talk. I think you're so good at what you do. <laughs> you love listening I, to I do. I love listening to you um, talk about the material because most of the time we're just solving logistical problems in the house. Although now we have our podcast, the Be Your Own Boss podcast. Yeah, people should also check that out byobpodcast.com if you're into uh, entrepreneurship we share everything that we've learned on that on that podcast all right so you've heard from jacob morgan author of the future leader definitely check out his course i watched him record it i know how valuable it is and how much work he put into it if you have time please leave me a review on itunes to help more people find my growing show and follow her on spotify <laughs> thank you for listening Thanks again for tuning into The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please remember to follow me on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your favorite platform at futureofworkpodcast.com. And also, don't forget to check out my brand new podcast on entrepreneurship with my wife, Blake, at byobpodcast.com. If you want to reach out to me about sponsoring the show or if you just have feedback for me, please send me an email jacob at the future organization.com. And of course, I would love a review or a rating on Apple podcasts or whatever your preferred channel is. 